I want to congratulate the residents that presented this morning. It's very exciting. You've, you know, clearly you've got some great projects going and the work that's already been put into them is meaningful and I'm looking forward to seeing them all progress. It is with great pleasure that I introduce Carolyn Kaiserman Schmackler. I've always got to look at that name. There's only four <laughs> letters in my last name. This is too confusing for me. <laughs> but it's a beautiful name. So Carolyn grew up in Coral Springs, Florida, and then she decided she needed to leave the South. I went to college at the University of Pennsylvania, and she also attended medical school there. Deb Driscoll, who's chair at Penn, called me up when she was a medical student and said, look, you got to take this, this student. She's amazing. I thought, hmm, okay then. And then, of course, when you interviewed, we all saw that to be true. And it's really just been a pleasure having you here. And as everyone knows, she's matched in urogynecology. I know that's not the formal name, but it's still the one I use. At the University of Michigan, which is, you know, just a fabulous, fabulous program. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. Okay, Carol and all you, baby. So I'm really excited to talk about this topic this morning, transgender healthcare for the gynecologist. I sort of got interested in it because it's not only been a hot topic in the media recently, but also I've heard a lot more talk about it within our own department, uh, pertaining to our own transgender patients here. And I kind of saw some people knew a little bit, some people knew a lot, some people knew nothing. But there certainly was some extent of a knowledge gap, and I had that too. So I've learned so much putting together this presentation, and I hope that you learn a lot from listening to it as well. So conflicts of interest. So does anyone recognize this image here, know what it is? Nobody? So I didn't know what it was until I started preparing this talk either. But this is actually the transgender pride flag. And it appears on a lot of transgender pride materials, and you'll see it throughout my talk. So I just wanted to start with a little straw poll here. Just by raising hands, who here has known a transgender person? Basically everybody. What about how many people here have seen a transgender patient? Almost everybody. And how many people have operated on a transgender patient? Also a really good number of people. So we definitely have some experience here, so that's great. Quick outline of the talk today. We're going to go through a lot of background because I think it's really important to kind of put this all in context. Then we will start getting into the healthcare specifics and more into the actual process of transitioning that we may be assisting patients with. And finally, we'll talk about some current news pertaining to the transgender community. So we'll start by going over some terms, just to make this all a little bit more clear when you're talking to and about our patients. There's really a whole language to learn here. So the Oxford English Dictionary defines gender as either of the two sexes, male and female, especially when considered with reference to social and cultural differences rather than biological ones. This is a very traditional uh, definition of gender, where sex is really the biological, and then gender is the social construct. But now, the updated Oxford English Dictionary goes on to say, this term is also used more broadly to denote a range of identities that do not correspond to established ideas of male and female. And this is really a more modern understanding of gender and a lot of what we'll talk about here today, the blending and, and the spectrum. So gender identity. This means our internal personal sense of what our gender is. And as you can see in this picture here, it really is a spectrum. It's not just all the way male or all the way female. There are people who feel in between, closer to one side or another, or really right in the middle. Gender expression, then, is how we express our gender on the outside, so the face that we're putting on for the world. You can express this through hairstyles, makeup, clothing, but it's really how you're showing your expression of what you're feeling on the inside. Cisgender is a term that identifies a person who feels the same as the sex they were assigned at birth. So when my mother was told at the hospital, you have a baby girl, I still feel like a woman, I'm a cisgender person. On the other hand, transgender, or for short trans, the topic we'll be going over here, refers to people whose gender identity does not traditionally match the sex that they were assigned at birth. 
transvestite is a term you may have heard, which actually specifically refers to people who have a preference for cross-dressing, but not necessarily a desire to actually change their biological sex. Gender non-conforming, getting more into the spectrum, is a person whose gender is or appears to be different from the gender they were assigned at birth. And I put this picture here of this little boy because I just love this story. This is a little boy who's gender non-conforming, and he always told his mom that he wanted to shop at the store Justice, uh, that their little tagline is just for girls, Justice just for girls. So he always felt like he wasn't welcome in there, even though he really wanted to wear their clothes. So his mom talked to one of the managers at their local Justice, and they actually shut the store down one night for him to come shop. And as you can see in this picture, he was really excited about these clothes. So I just think that's a great story. Gender queer refers to a person whose gender is not just a man or a woman. And this is where it might get confusing, it might make you feel uncomfortable if this is a new concept to you. So there are people who may feel more like a man one day and more like a woman another day. And there are people who really might feel in between, like a third gender. This is also where some of the different pronouns come into play that you may or may not have ever heard. So you can imagine someone who doesn't necessarily feel like a man or a woman might not want to be referred to as he or she. That might be uncomfortable for them. So this is where some of these different pronouns come in. Sometimes people will use they as a singular pronoun as opposed to plural. Z, A, or Z with an X. This might sound really funky to you. I really like this cartoon that probably brings up some of the questions in your head and some of the questions that were in my head as well. And this comes straight from the transgender community. So it tells you pronoun do's and don'ts. Don't respond as, what? Z isn't a real pronoun. Don't you have something more normal you can use? And don't say, but it's not grammatically correct to use they as a singular pronoun. And that's totally what happened in my head, because I love grammar. So it's all about respecting people's choices and not putting our thoughts or feelings onto them. Intersex is a term that refers to people born with a sex that does not typically fit the definitions of male or female due to genetic, hormonal, or anatomic differences. So, for example, this is when we might deliver a baby and say they have ambiguous genitalia, or somebody with uh, androgen insensitivity syndrome. This is refers to really more of a biological condition. Queer is a very broad term, referring to people who are not necessarily straight and or cisgender. This used to be considered a very derogatory term, and has more recently been taken back by the community and used more as a term of pride. When we say transitioning, this is the process, social, legal, and or medical, that a trans person might go through to make their gender identity fit their gender expression. And this is what we may be assisting our patients with medically. And the term transsexual specifically refers to people who have completed a transition with reassignment surgery. You may have heard of gender identity disorder. It is actually an old term from the DSM-4, which came out in 1994, quite a while ago. It was a diagnosis for patients who would experience significant gender dysphoria and wish to live their lives as the opposite sex. You can imagine being labeled with a disorder can be distressing for someone. So the newer DSM, the DSM-5, which came out just a few years ago in 2013, has gotten rid of that old diagnosis and now calls it gender dysphoria. Note that uh, disorder is not in the diagnosis anymore. This is a diagnosis for distress that's caused by a discrepancy between a person's gender identity and natal sex. So very similar to the old definition, but a new term, and this is what we should be using now. And this is, of course, a diagnosis that should be given by a psychiatrist and not by a gynecologist, but it's important to understand how the diagnosis is made. So I just wanted to briefly go over the criteria. Might bring you back to med school and learning all the criteria for psychiatric disorders. 
but they first have to have a marked incongruence between experienced or expressed gender and assigned gender of at least six months duration. So you know they always have a duration on these uh, diagnoses as manifested by two or more of the following of these six indicators. So an incongruence between their experience or expressed gender and primary secondary sex characteristic. They may have a strong desire to be rid of their secondary sex characteristic, or if they're a younger person, desire to prevent the development of those secondary sex characteristics. They may have a strong desire for the primary secondary sex characteristics of the other sex or other gender a strong desire to be of the other gender or some alternative gender, a strong desire to be treated as the other gender, or a strong conviction that they have the typical feelings and reactions of the other gender. And again, you only have to have two of those six indicators. And then B, like all psychiatric diagnoses, it has to be associated with significant distress that affects your life. So it sounds simple, right? When I talk about it in terms of definitions and makes it all seem black and white, but really it's not. This is a really complicated topic and people express it in a lot of different ways. So I had a lot of fun looking up infographics of how people express the spectrum of gender identity. So here shows a quite complicated Venn diagram of how gendered someone might feel. And you can see there's a lot of different places you can fall in here. Then some other person expressed it as this nice graph where you can be all the way female on one end, all the way male on the other end, agender in one corner, and possibly genderqueer, bigender, or some other third gender in the other corner, and then anywhere in between. I also love the genderbred person, which appears a lot. Um, and this <laughs> includes some other factors in it as well that your whole Gender is going to be, include your physical sex, your gender expression, gender identity, your romantic orientation, and sexual orientation. And they all can come together in different ways. Another really popular expression is the gender unicorn, which I've seen a lot and is cool. So again, this includes a spectrum of gender identity, gender expression, sex assigned at birth, who you're physically attracted to and then who you're emotionally attracted to. And any one person can fall anywhere on all these arrows. So this kind of creates like infinite combinations of how someone might feel about their gender and their sexual orientation. So hopefully this is sort of starting to broaden your ideas about gender and set the stage that we really should not assume anything about our patients and how they feel. Now we'll get into some history of the transgender community, which is really fun to learn about. You might be thinking, is this a new concept? Is this some like hippie millennial thing now? But the answer is no. This has been around as long as society has been around. And it even dates back to ancient Assyria thousands of years ago. There are examples of people who were born as men who functioned in women's roles and often as prostitutes but also would participate in public processions and sometimes simulate giving birth. Then in India, there's an interesting example of a group of people called the Hijra, and this dates back, again, to ancient times and still exists today. And these are people who are typically born male, but live in a female role. And it takes on different expressions. Sometimes they live in their own community. Sometimes they're part of the general community. Sometimes they're thought of as an actual third gender, and in some South Asian countries, you can actually put this third gender on your passport as an official documentation. And in some groups of Hijra, they're actually castrated. So it's been around for quite a long time. Here in America, there has been uh, documents of two-spirit people in the Native American communities dating back from when white settlers first got to the US. And this is kind of expressed in different ways in different tribes, but there are examples of people who kind of are understood to have the spirit of a man and the spirit of a woman. And a lot of Native American tribes don't even really have firm gender categories, but some of them that do have four gender categories, including a masculine man, a feminine woman, a masculine woman, or a feminine man. So they have 
you know, really a lot broader, I think, ideas about gender than we typically do. Now I'll get into some modern transgender history. So I started with 1952. This actress, Christine Jorgensen, was a trans woman who really brought a lot of trans awareness because she came out and was a public figure and started getting people aware of this condition. Jumping ahead to 1969, the Stonewall Riots, I believe, were very important. So the Stonewall Inn was a very common gathering place for transgender individuals. And when riots broke out in 1969, this was really considered to be the birth of the modern LGBT movement. Over in Sweden in 1972, they became the first country to legalize sex change. That's a long time ago, so they're pretty progressive. Back to the U.S. in 1977, some of you might remember Renee Richards, who is a professional tennis player, transgender woman. And in 1977, the New York Supreme Court actually ruled that she could play in the women's league of tennis. The story turns darker in the 1990s. There were, unfortunately, a series of transgender murders. And pictured here is Rita Hester. One year after her death in 1999 became the first annual Transgender Day of Remembrance, which is still celebrated every November. And unfortunately, there have been a lot of transgender persons who have died of murder that we have to remember. In 2007, unfortunately, another murder occurred of this woman, Angie Zapata. And this was the first time that a transgender murder had been considered a hate crime against a transgender person. Previously, they had not been considered hate crimes. And even now, not everywhere in the U.S. considers it a hate crime if it's a crime against someone's sexual identity. In 2008, uh, some of you probably watched America's Next Top Model. I did. And I definitely remember when Isis King was the first trans model on the show. So trans models have actually existed for a long time, and the fashion community has really embraced um, androgyny. But this was the first time, I think, that it became public to a really wide audience, and a lot of young girls watched this show, so it brought a lot of publicity. And in 2008 as well, this woman, Stu Rasmussen, became the first openly trans mayor in the U.S., in Silverton, Oregon. And since there have been actually a good number of trans people elected to government offices. In 2012, interestingly, the Miss Universe pageant opened to trans contestants based on this woman who was a Canadian contestant who was originally disqualified for being trans and appealed and had the rules changed. Most of you probably recognize this woman, Laverne Cox. She, in 2014, became the first trans person on the cover of Time magazine. And she's one of the stars of the very popular Netflix show, Orange is the New Black. She's been a really outspoken activist for the trans community. And she was also the first trans person nominated for an Emmy, but she did not win. And then I'm sure all of you recognize Caitlyn Jenner, who in 2015 came out in a TV interview. She had previously been very famous for when she was previously Bruce Jenner as a Olympic athlete, highly celebrated, and then became widely known to audiences when she was on Keeping Up with the Kardashians. So this was a big moment for the trans community that gave a lot of exposure. And she, I think, is kind of finding her role as a spokesperson for the trans community as she was forced into that role, really. All right, so that's the history that I chose to highlight here, but honestly, there's so much interesting trans history that I could talk about for an hour. If you're interested, I would encourage looking it up. So then we'll, we'll get into the healthcare side of things. So we'll start with how we can make our offices more LGBTQ friendly. So some things we can do are just putting up symbols of LGBTQ pride. Everyone I'm sure recognizes the rainbow flag, really a traditional symbol of the community. Maybe lesser known is the pink triangle, also a symbol of pride with a sad history that this was a symbol that the Nazis forced gay men to wear in concentration camps and has now, again, been taken back as a, as a symbol of pride for the community. 
And then we can make sure that our restrooms are unisex because choosing which restroom to use as a transgender person can be a very sensitive issue. We can also make sure that along with all of our walls of pamphlets, we have some pamphlets out about LGBTQ health. And these are easy to get from a number of organizations. We can also display a non-discrimination policy so that our patients know outright that they will not be discriminated against for their sexual identity, gender identity. And in our waiting rooms, we can make sure that we have magazines that focus on LGBTQ issues too. I just took a brief look around the Arboretum Clinic yesterday, and the only one of these things that we do is the unisex bathroom. So we have a ways to go to make our office more LGBTQ friendly. And we do have a lot of LGBTQ uh, patients in our Arboretum Clinic, so I think this is something we should focus on. Next, we'll talk about how you can open a dialogue with your transgender patients, because you might just kind of be wary of, what do I say? So some suggestions are, first and foremost, ask about their pronoun preference. This can be a really sticky subject for our trans patients. If you use the wrong pronoun, it can make them feel really misunderstood. So just ask outright, what pronoun do you prefer? Again, you cannot assume anything about your patients of what they might prefer based on what they look like. We should use gender neutral language to talk about relationships and avoid making assumptions about the gender of the partner. So just because someone is a transgender female to male, you have no idea whether they're having sex with men or women or both, and don't assume. And you can use words like partner instead of spouse or girlfriend or wife or something like that. Always just ask about previous hormone use and gender confirmation surgeries because we don't know how to best treat our patients unless we really know what medications they're on, which would be hormones, and what organs they have or do not have, uh, which may have come from gender confirmation surgeries. We should, I mean, always ask non-judgmental questions about sexual practices and behaviors. But again, this is just laying on that same note of don't assume what kind of sex that your patient is having. Just ask. You can know better what they're at risk for if you know what kind of sexual practices they're engaging in. And if some unfamiliar terms come up, just ask to clarify. You might feel embarrassed about asking, but it's really better to know than to just be embarrassed and not say anything and then not really know, again, what the risks are. And then finally, it's OK to express your inexperience and as long as you be express willingness to become educated. So for example, as happened the other day, if a transgender man comes into your clinic for a colposcopy, and you're like, I've never treated a transgender person before, I don't know how to deal with this. I mean, you can express that and say that you want to learn more and maybe refer them to someone who, who has more of an interest in this community. Now we'll talk about some of the health risks specific to the transgender community, which we need to be on the lookout for. And a lot of these come from this very large survey study that was called the National Transgender Discrimination Survey Report on Health and Healthcare. And it surveyed over 7,000 people who are transgender and gender non-conforming. So one of the results here, when they asked about seeking medical care, they asked how many people or healthcare providers know or believe you're transgender or gender non-conforming. This was kind of shocking, shocking to me that 21% of them said none of their healthcare providers would know. And really, how can we treat our patients best if we don't even know that they're transgender? And only 28% of them said that all their healthcare providers would know. So you might think, why might they not tell me? Well, this is really the answer. There's a lot of discrimination, unfortunately. So in this total sample of patients, 19% of them said that they had experienced refusal of care based on their gender identity. This is very sad. And the higher number are in our male to female transgender patients, but still significant in our female to male transgender patients. Um, and this can lead to avoiding medical care, as we see here. So this question asks about postponement of care due to feeling discriminated against by providers. And again, a pretty high rate. So if we look at our female to male patients in the second column, which is mostly of what we'll see, 42% of them reported postponing needed care 
And then almost half of them reported uh, postponing preventative care, things like screening tests, which we know are extremely important. HIV, obviously a big deal. Bigger deal in this population than the general population as well. So you can see in the, all the way on the left side, in the general population, there's about a 0.6% HIV prevalence. And then in this survey, 2.64% of the patients had HIV, which is about four times the rate of the general population. And you can see all the way on the right that it's by far the highest in the African-American transgender community. And a lot of this risk comes from transgender people turning to sex work to survive. Substance use, also more of a problem in the LGBT community rather than the rest of the population, more than twice as prevalent. And a lot of patients have expressed that they use substances to cope with the depression and the discrimination and the feelings of isolation that they experience. So this is something that we should be screening for and referring for. Going along with those feelings of suicide and isolation, or depression, are suicide attempts. Much higher in the transgender population than in the general population. So you can see in this sample, 41% of them had stated that they had ever attempted suicide. Compared to in the general population, it's just over 1%. So so, so much higher, and obviously something that is a very big deal and that we should be screening for suicidal ideation in all our patients, but especially in very high-risk patients like this. So now we'll get into more uh, on the nitty-gritty of transitioning, and we'll start with talking about hormone therapy. So there was actually just recently, last month, a committee opinion on Care for Transgender Adolescents from ACOG. So we'll talk a little bit about this. And the first hormone treatment that you might experience as a transgender patient is an adolescent is the option of using a DNRH agonist for puberty suppression. And there are some criteria that are very specific for who should be allowed to go on the DNRH agonist for puberty suppression. And this is from that ECUG bulletin. So they should have a diagnosis made by a psychiatrist for gender dysphoria, transgender, or transsexualism. The physical exam has to be tanner stage two or greater. Essentially, that's a marker of maturity for being ready to make this decision. Their pubertal changes should worsen their gender dysphoria. There should not be any psychiatric illness that prevents their proper diagnosis no psychiatric or medical contraindications for treatment, and they should have adequate support to help them through this process. And then, of course, they have to understand what they're going through, so informed consent. And these changes are fully reversible, which is really important for our patients to know. And the idea behind doing puberty suppression is giving our patients a little bit more time to think about taking the more drastic steps towards transitioning, some of which are irreversible. Also, because some adolescents will change their mind. They might have strong gender dysphoria when they're young that will actually lessen as they get older. And again, this gives them the chance to maybe try out living in the other gender role without those secondary sex characteristics coming in that might be very distressing to them. So then if they decide to go to the next step, which would be using cross-sex hormones to actually transition, using testosterone or estrogen, they have to fulfill all that criteria on the left side, but also be 16 years or older. That's just the recommendation here in the US. And some of these changes are reversible from these hormones, some are not. So back to the puberty suppression, there are some issues to consider when we're using puberty suppression. We might be causing iatrogenic low bone mineral density. We might be preventing them from reaching an adequate gender appropriate height by suppressing their puberty. And interestingly, in male, genetically male patients, they may, if they're suppressed, eventually have insufficient penile tissue to do certain types of vaginoplasty if that's something that they might want in the future. 
So I'm going to say this is pediatric endocrinologist territory. This is really not what we should be handling as gynecologists because there are so many things to consider here uh, with the hormones. So once we get into masculinizing hormones, people taking testosterone, some of the effects that you'll see, I'm sure you could predict, but skin oiliness and acne, facial and body hair growth, so we might start growing male facial hair, scalp hair loss, like in a typical male pattern baldness can happen, get increased muscle mass and strength, a body fat redistribution, often a cessation of menses, clitoral enlargement, vaginal atrophy, and a deepened voice. The deepened voice is usually irreversible, and the clitoral enlargement may be irreversible. Many of these other changes are reversible if you stop taking testosterone. So it's important when we're counseling about this. There are also some risks of taking masculinizing hormones that we have to be aware of if our patients are on them. So they can cause polycythemia, hyperlipidemia, hypertension, mood changes, hepatitis rarely, and it has a possible effect on fertility. This is something that our patients may be very sensitive to if they may want to bear children in the future. And it's a little bit debated in the literature whether how much we know about the effect of, on fertility of taking testosterone. It, it definitely does not, it does not definitely preclude your fertility though. So that we know. You can get pregnant after taking testosterone. All right, so now we will get into surgical therapy, which we may be assisting with. So the surgical options for a male to female trans person are breast and chest surgery, often considered top surgery, uh, which would be a breast augmentation. In the general surgery, something, some procedures that are done are a penectomy, an orchiectomy, an vaginoplasty, clitoroplasty, and vulvoplasty. And if you've ever seen before and after pictures of some of these surgeries, they can look so natural, like you would never know that they were not born with female external genitalia. And then some of the other non-genital, non-breast surgeries include facial feminization surgery, liposuction, <coughs> lipofilling, voice surgery to make the voice pitch higher, thyroid cartilage reduction, so shaving of the Adam's apple, a gluteal augmentation, hair reconstruction, and then some aesthetic procedures. So you can imagine there's a wide range of surgeons who are going to do these different procedures, and our patients may have to go see a lot of different surgeons if they want to do all this transitioning. In the female to male patients, uh, the analogous options are on the top surgery getting a mastectomy and creation of a male chest. And again, this can look completely natural if done well. In the general surgery, the hysterectomy and ovarectomy is probably what we would be assisting with as gynecologists. The rest is probably more in the realm of urologists, um, plastic surgeon, urogynecologist doing some of the reconstructive surgery. So reconstructing the fixed part of the urethra can be com combined with a metoidioplasty, which is using an enlarged clitoris after taking testosterone and making it look more like a phallus, or a complete phalloplasty, which often has a flap, sometimes from the forearm, a vaginectomy, scrotoplasty, and they can even do implantation of erection and or testicular prostheses. And again, these can look amazingly natural. And then again, the other bodily surgeries you can have, rarely you need voice surgery because usually testosterone will deepen the voice. And then the liposuction, lipofilling, pectoral implants, and some aesthetic procedures just to make the whole body and face look a little bit more masculine. Now, I think it's really important to know the minimum requirements before our patients are eligible for surgery. And these come from the World Professional Association of Transgender Health, called WPATH, and they put out this long 100-page document called the Standards of Care, which I would really recommend reading if you are treating transgender patients surgically, because they put out these requirements that we really should be following. So to get surgical intervention, you have to be the legal age of majority in any country, so here that's 18. Sometimes it's budged a little bit for, for top surgery. Uh, they have to have persistent, well-documented gender dysphoria, the capacity to make a fully informed decision and consent, of course. And if they have significant mental 
medical or mental health concerns, they must be reasonably well controlled. So generally being a good surgical candidate. And then there are additional requirements for specific procedures. And this really gets technical here. For uh, hysterectomy BSO, they really should be on 12 continuous months of hormone therapy as appropriate to their gender goals. Unless, of course, they have a contraindication. And for the bottom surgery, in addition to that, they should have 12 continuous months of living in a gender role that is congruent with their gender identity. And I think this is really to make sure that the patient definitely wants these irreversible changes to their body. There are also mental health requirements for each of these procedures, which we have to rely on our psychiatric colleagues for. So for chest surgery, they're required to have one referral from a qualified mental health professional. And then for bottom surgery, they're required to have actually two referrals from mental health professionals who have independently assessed the patient. So we are going to be looking for these letters if we're doing the surgery. And we should know what should be in the letters to make sure that they came from a qualified mental health professional. So they should include general identifying characteristics of the patient, results of any psychosocial assessment, including any diagnoses they've been given, their duration of relationship with the patient, an explanation that the criteria for surgery have been met, and brief description of clinical rationale for supporting their request for surgery. A statement about informed consent, and a statement that the mental health professional is willing to really work with you and have a relationship with you as the surgeon. So they have to do, I think, a lot of the legwork here in making sure that this patient is qualified and has gone through all the appropriate steps. And then if we're satisfied with those letters, we can feel comfortable going ahead and taking the responsibility of doing the surgery on the patient. So then you're probably thinking about whether there's insurance coverage for these procedures. And this is a really hot topic and it's constantly changing. But I like this map from the Human Rights Campaign website that shows general uh, health insurance coverage for transgender surgeries. So in the dark blue, it shows states with bans on insurance ex insurance exclusions for transgender health care. So they're saying any insurance in the state has to cover it. And that's only Colorado, Illinois, and Vermont. In green are the states with transgender inclusive health benefits for state employees. So that's just Maryland and Minnesota. And then finally, the light blue are states that have both of those. So really, the most inclusive states for transgender health care coverage. And that's the entire West Coast, plus um, New York, Connecticut, Massachusetts, and DC. You can see Wisconsin does not have any of these things. So there's essentially no protections for needing to have any kind of coverage for transgender health care. So it's going to differ insurance by insurance carrier. And I also recommend going to this website, the Human Rights Campaign, if you're interested in kind of statewide rights for LGBT issues. And they have all these fun interactive maps that you can look at. So finally, we'll talk about some general OBGYN care for our transgender patients. So we cannot forget about regular gynecologic care, including treating menstrual problems like we do almost every day. So you can imagine a female to male transgender person who doesn't even feel comfortable having a uterus might be extremely distressed by abnormal uterine bleeding or dysmenorrhea. So that's something that we should address, and we know really well how to address that. And we can use all of our typical hormonal methods, considering if they're on testosterone, putting them on oral contraceptive pills might not be the best idea, but using something like a marine IUD is a great idea. STI screening and prevention, of course, I already told you this is a really high-risk population. So we should be appropriately screening based on what kind of sexual practices they're engaging in. And again, that involves asking. Our cancer screening. Again, our patients might feel uncomfortable and might, might have delayed screening for many years. But we want to make them feel comfortable so that they'll come in for their regular screening. And we know if you have a cervix, you need to be getting cast. If you have breast tissue, you need to be getting breast exams and mammograms. And that even involves male to female transgender patients who are taking estrogen, they can still develop breast cancer. And they might still be BRCA positive. And these are things that we have to consider. And you might never expect a male to female transgender patient to come to your office as a gynecologist. But for some people, it kind of affirms their gender role. 
going to the gynecologist. So we should embrace those patients as well if they choose to come to see us. Contraception, big deal. So someone on testosterone who's not getting periods might feel like they cannot get pregnant. But obviously we all know that you can get pregnant if you have a uterus and you're having sex with a genetic male. So contraception is something that we should bring up and talk about the risk of unintended pregnancy, which might be distressing for someone or might be what they plan. So transgender men have babies too, and we may be seeing them in our clinics and on the OB floor. So we should be sensitive to these issues. I did find a good study on this. There's really not a lot of studies on transgender pregnancies, but this one was a survey study of transgender men who got pregnant after transitioning, and they had a total of 41 transgender men complete the survey who've been pregnant and delivered after transitioning, and they collected some quantitative and qualitative data that I'll share kind of the highlights of this. So 61% of them had used testosterone before pregnancy, so clearly you can get pregnant if you're using testosterone. And among those had used testosterone, 80% resumed menses within six months of stopping testosterone. So that's kind of something maybe we could quote our patients if they're asking about when they might resume menses. And five of them, or 20% of the study, conceived while still amenorrheic from testosterone use. So again, that's getting at that unintended pregnancy rate. Participants who had previously used testosterone were more likely to prefer the pronoun he, whereas those who had not used the testosterone in the past were more likely to identify with they. So again, just getting back to asking what pronouns our patients prefer. Two-thirds of them were planned. Only 15% had a preconception medical consultation. And again, I would probably like these patients to have a preconception medical consultation because they have different issues in the general population, but they, like we talked about before, often feel discriminated against and might feel really uncomfortable about talking to someone about this. Their pregnancy delivery and birth outcomes did not differ at all according to prior testosterone use. And then they asked some open-ended questions, too, about effect of the pregnancy on concepts of family structure, feelings of isolation, gender dysphoria affected by pregnancy, and their interactions with healthcare providers. So I'll just share some of the quotes that stood out to me from this study. This man said, pregnancy and childbirth were very male experiences for me. When I birthed my children, I was born into fatherhood. A lot of the participants used words like dad, carrier, and gestational parent to affirm their male gender identity and describe their parenting roles. This is obviously very different than what we're used to. This man said, heavy time having a baby, not passing as male. All the changes in a society telling me to just be happy. So this is, you know, something that makes make you feel really uncomfortable, that you're used to the world looking at you as male, and now all of a sudden you have this big pregnant belly, and people are like, what, what is this? And that can make you feel really uncomfortable and isolated. So a lot of these patients have also expressed higher rates of postpartum depression, so that's something that we may be aware of. This man was happy. He said, I was always called he, I was always called dad, and my body parts were always called by the words I used. This comes up a lot. That the highest dissatisfaction, it seems, with healthcare is when patients are not called by the pronouns that they want to be called by and not using the language that they prefer. So something to be sensitive to, but it might be really hard for us, and we can acknowledge that. All the rest of our patients are female and are called she and her and hers. So it's just natural for us to say that. So it kind of takes a minute to like think back, oh, he. But it's really important to make our patients feel comfortable. Unfortunately, this man said Health Protection Services was alerted to the fact that a tranny had a baby. That is not the kind of experience that we want our patients to have. And this really brings up the fact that it's not just us as the providers that need to be educated on this, but also the staff that needs to be educated. So in our offices, the people at the front desk, the nurses, the MAs, anyone who's interacting with our patients, who might even have more interaction with our patients on labor and delivery than we do, need to be educated about how to treat our patients with sensitivity. So what's the ideal model of care for our transgender patients? I would say it's an interdisciplinary model of care because you can see there's a lot of care providers that are helping out here with transition. I think a really good model of this is at University of Michigan, fully unbiased, um, but they have this uh, University of Michigan Health Systems Comprehensive Gender Services Program. 
that is completely interdisciplinary and is really a first stop for transgender patients who are thinking about not even just having primary health care, but also psychiatric care and surgical care. Um, and it's, it's really combines all these providers together to, I think, make it a better experience for the patients. It says here they use the WPATH standards of care, which we went over. And their website is just a really good if you're interested in this model of care, talking about all the different services that they have in one place. Now you might be asking, what do we have here at University of Wisconsin? Well, we have one transgender clinic at American Family Children's Hospital in the Pediatric Endocrinology Division. It's called PATH Clinic, Pediatric and Adolescent Transgender Health Clinic. And again, they really only see adolescents. They do a lot of the hormone therapy, which like I said, is completely appropriate for endocrinology to be doing. But this isn't a really inclusive uh, interdisciplinary clinic. They say on their website that they can refer you to a mental health provider, but they don't have mental health providers there in their clinic. So I think there's a lot of leeway for what we can do here at the UW to make a more interdisciplinary clinic and best treat our transgender patients. So finally, we'll just kind of talk about some things that are in the news today, because I feel like there's news stories popping up about this every single day. I'm sure you've heard about the bathroom bills. This has been highly talked about. So in March 2016, North Carolina passed this law called HB2 that forced transgender students to use bathrooms and locker rooms that accord with the sex on their birth certificate, no matter how they identify. This, as you can imagine, can be highly distressing to transgender youth, which they might look very male and not want to go into the female bathroom. This law also prohibits local governments from passing any LGBT, LGBT inclusive non-discrimination protections. So that's kind of sad. So this law has had a huge amount of backlash that I'm sure you've heard about. And it's estimated that it's cost North Carolina $630 million in lost business. This estimate was put out by Forbes magazine because so many um, groups have pulled their events out of North Carolina as re a resistance to this law. This is, I think, on a better note. The Boy Scouts recently, just this year, opened membership to transgender boys. And this boy pictured here was the first transgender boy who got to be a Boy Scout. He had previously been kicked out of Boy Scouts when they found out he was trans. And he fought it, or his parents fought it, and now their rules have changed. Recently, Fashion Week happened. And this woman was the first transgender model to walk in India's Fashion Week. She's so gorgeous. And it's really cool that the U.S. didn't even have to have an article about this because there are actually so many transgender models walking in New York Fashion Week. Jazz Jennings, you may have heard of. She had a show on TLC about my life as a transgender teen and I think really got a lot of kids to understand a little bit more what it means to be transgender. And now there's a transgender doll of her coming out at the New York City Toy Fair. So thanks for listening, and I just wanted to finish with three movie recommendations. I love movies, and these are, I think, a good way to kind of learn more about the experience of being a transgender person. You can be entertained. So the first one to recommend is The Danish Girl, which probably some of you have seen. This, I think, has pretty wide appeal, and it's about Lily Elvey, who was the first person to get uh, sex reassignment surgery. That was in Denmark. And it's a really beautiful movie. It will probably make you cry. And it won Alicia Vikander an Oscar last year. The next one I have to recommend is the movie Tangerine, which is probably for the more adventurous movie watchers. It, first of all, was all shot on an iPhone, so that's amazing. And it features, it's a story about two transgender prostitutes and their experiences, and it's kind of a wild ride. And I... I just thought it was awesome. And then finally, if you like documentaries, I recommend The Trans List, which is on HBO. And if you have HBO streaming, you can just access it easily. This is done by a photographer whose focus is photographing marginalized communities. So he did a project called The Black List. He did a project called The Outlist. And now he did The Trans List, 
which he not only photographed these transgender people, but also allowed them to speak in this just really beautiful documentary that just gives really raw experiences about what it's like to grow up and become an adult as a transgender person. So, thank you.